coverage here at Grand Prix Oklahoma City. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm in the booth with Ben Seck. Hello. Good morning, Ben. Morning. We've got uh, Modern in the Morning here on a Sunday. We're going to be working our way all the way up to the top eight and, of course, giving away a trophy and 10,000 smackers tonight. <laughs> but uh, for now, we're still in the trenches here. we still got a lot of work to do before we get to that cut to the top eight. And these are the players that are in a good position to do so. Right now, we're not talking about locked for top eight or anything like that. But these guys are in a good spot. They're coming in with 27 match points. One loss. Which means that they've only got one loss. Oh. Uh. Uh. Efro with a little personalized message for his wife. <laughs> it is their anniversary. How nice. <laughs> Thanks. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are you allowed to use in-game notes like that? Ben? Yeah, that I, I don't know. I think it's, <laughs> we're at the competitive or I think professional rule enforcement, so we may have overstepped the line. But, you know, I think we can make an exception for an anniversary. Okay. Ben, the benevolent Ben has, uh, <laughs> has spoken. So Eric is actually on a deck that he told me last night. He said, you know, this is not a deck I thought I would ever really play in a tournament. And he jokingly is calling it Ramanop Red. Uh, it's just a burn deck. <laughs> yep. And, uh, you know, it's been really serving him well. Yeah, I mean, he was like oh, basically one draw step away from actually being a perfect record yesterday. He was playing against Affinity, had about three draws to draw. One, you know, a, a burn spell did not get there. But he obviously won the first round of, of today. He actually played against Death Shadow. I talked to him a bit earlier. Okay. So, um, you know, off to a good start and still very well positioned to try and make a run at top eight here. That's right. And he's got this uh, Goblin Guide on turn one, which is the best possible start for the red deck. It is a recurring source of damage that, especially against a deck with not much defense like Storm, yep. can get in for a significant amount of damage. You see Brian using Opt to manipulate the top of his library to make sure that he hit a land there off of the Goblin Guide. Hey, he'll take it. Yes. But the truth is, is that, you know, Goblin Guide is able to apply so much pressure so quickly that uh, oftentimes you're stuck with those extra lands in your hand. And it looks like he's going to go Lava Spike to the dome here. So Brian is all the way down to 16, excuse me, down to 13 already. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, both these decks are fairly linear. And so there's not a lot of interaction between them. And so you want as many you know, recurring sources of damage, you, you just want as fast a clock as possible, and Goblin Guide really presents that. Storm a deck that generally, like, has trouble going off before turn four. Um, usually on turn two, hopes to get something like a, a cost reducer either Goblin Electromancer or Boral, Chief of Compliance. When you get a first turn Goblin Guide, often you're able to, you know, almost put a, first, a fourth to, uh, turn four clock yourself with Burn. Goblin Guide hitting for the third time this game. Any anytime that happens, it's pretty good for you. One of the things often things happen with Burn, they try and run a fairly lean mana base. And so they may get constrained on mana sometimes. And so like Ifro not hitting his third land drop and so you know might have some trouble <coughs> like emptying his hand completely. Yeah, and he does need to do it as quickly as possible, right, in this type of matchup because, you know, once Brian starts to go off, Efro is really going to have nothing to say about it. Yeah, he's, he's just going to have to sit there and watch him go. Right. And, uh, you know, usually when the Storm deck does, you know, ideally he's going to try to force him to go maybe a turn sooner than he'd be comfortable, take a little bit more risk. Mm -hmm. um, there are some cards in his hand, um, one of which is Searing Blaze, which isn't at their best against Storm. That being said, Storm often has to like play one of the creatures, either Electromancer or, or Baral, and so he does have a target sometimes for that. Right. By the way, chat corrected me earlier. I did say that Opt was hel helping to set up the top of the library for the Goblin Guide. That's not actually true. You, you draw the card no matter what. I mean, yes, you can get rid of a, a non-land card, but you, you're still just drawing it. So. <laughs> now, this card can, though. Uh, Serum Visions actually you know, does give you a scry, too, after you draw the card, and, and actually can set that up. Uh, to maybe hit an additional land off of the guide, but that was my mistake. 
Yeah, so one of the you know, little subtle things that uh, Ifro did was he kept his Arid Mesa in play for the entire uh, like, you know, turn cycle, his turn and his opponent's turn, because he wanted to make sure he had, he had options at the landfall um, with the Searing Blaze. Now, Brian did not play a creature into that, so, so he didn't get that advantage, but it's actually important to you know, be very careful about like, when you actually use your fetch lands to actually be able to make sure you get the full, dam full amount of damage there. <clears throat> There's a gift sun given on the top of the library for Brian as the Goblin Guide continues to smash, and life totals getting a little critical here for Brian. He is at six, which, you know, when you think about this type of deck, that's just two spells. Yep. That's, that's what that means. Two, two non-creature spells, and you're dead. So, Eric has the two burn spells to put Brian to, to zero. Can he deploy them this turn? He cannot. One, okay. of, which is, one of which is a lightning helix, another which okay. is a skull crack. Um, and look... Poetic Ritual. He's going off. Yeah, he, I mean, he knows he has to. Basically, right. he's at six. Oh, two man. Spells. This is about as close as we can possibly get because Eric literally has the win in his hand if he gets to untap. So here we go. Let's see if Brian can get out from just underneath the pressure from Eric Froelich with his burn deck here. <clears throat> this is a fascinating dynamic that you see in matchups like this. And he has really crafted a nice one, at least mana wise. Ritual, 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 ritual. Well, actually, the the the, the, Yo, the did next he one. Splice that he one? spliced that one. Yeah. So <laughs> ritual, ritual. ritual yeah. I can't say it fast <laughs> enough, but plenty of rituals. I mean, splicing is just one of the things. That doesn't happen that often. No, it doesn't. Because the only uh, arcane card in the uh, storm deck is another ritual, so you have to have two of them. So. It does look like... So, so, so one of the funny things... Brian was There's really, really careful. Pardon? There's passing flames. Yeah. yeah. Brian actually had the Baral. He's never deployed, uh, deployed it because he knows that all it does is it gives Eric a chance at disrupting it because he had the, the Searing Blades his previous turn. He has a burn spell. So he, he knows if he just plays it, it just eats up mana. Right. Looks like the storm counts at five. Yep. Now he's playing the Baral because he knows that he already has cast all the spells that he needs to cast. And like the, the way he, he's already played the Parson Flames. And if Eric chooses to kill the Baral, he can just like cast all the rituals in response. Right. And here we go. Ritual. Storm count seven. I believe he actually has the kill here now because, like, he can just cast all those rituals back. Yeah. Um, and he How has does a he gift, win, though? He has a gift of gifts ungiven in his hand. Okay. And so what that allows him to do is to basically... <laughs> Eric's helping to keep track of Storm <laughs> Count at this yeah. point. Yeah, he, he, he's basically able to guarantee getting the Grape Shot because um, he's able to use the Passion Flames to, to essentially cast... He like, can then flash, flash it, it back. back and then use the Grape Shot from his yard. Right. Okay. Wow, about as close as they get. Eric, with lethal burn in hand, all he can do is sit here and watch Brian Hine just go off with the storm deck. I mean, this was the difference between, you know, having a lightning helix versus an additional lightning bolt or another <laughs> lava spike. Yeah, actually, the thing is, that, I mean, that, that's a good point. Eric actually has a lightning helix in hand. So what he's tr he might be trying to do is to, like... Getting Brian to only do 16 or, let's say, less than 19 damage. Right. If he does 18, he can be like, gotcha. Gotcha. So I, I, I'm i not exactly sure about the current count, whether he actually can do, you know, like 19 damage. But if he cannot, he uh, the Helix will actually get him out of range. Yeah. I mean, it feels like if he wants, he can do way more than 19 damage. It's just a matter of... Yeah, he, does he do it? Right, he, he he may just not have it on his radar. I mean, I, it's like yeah. you know, Brian's well, already nine look, one. We're we're looking at we're sitting from Eric's seat. Yeah, that's what you're thinking. Yes, right. Like that's Brian what he probably to knows that he's going to go for twenty eight or whatever. <laughs> but you know, but Eric has to say, well, maybe he'll maybe he'll be like sixteen. You and yep. you're like, well, gotcha. Now that's fourteen. 14. 
So he, he, he needs to get to 19. 19. Okay. There's a couple of ways of getting there. He can either draw another grape shot. Just do it again. Yep. He, I mean, he could definitely do it because he has... Uh, he's basically just mana morphosed. Um, so he has another blue available to him. So he gifts again. Um, and what that gifts again likely does is it gives him access to the second grape shot. Presuming that he has a second one in his deck, we can just have a quick check. He has three grape shots, so he's able to be sure about this. And Eric basically realizes, you know, he's going to go for the second grape shot and go well past 19 damage. Wow, about as close as they get there. We saw a great start from Frolic, but, you know... On the other side of the table there, Brian was like, okay, I know exactly the turn I need to go, and I need it to go well. Like, yep. I need to, to Eric not to go bull bolt, you yep. know, something like that. And uh, and he did and was able to go off. He crafted a beautiful hand there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like Rituals he, galore. He, he, I, I can't stress enough to say that he didn't put the Baral out early because he knew that he needed it to go off as much as he did on the, on the, on the final turn. So... I, th I think a lot of people who are less experienced with that deck might have actually just run out the Baral and, you know... Especially it, thinking, I'm going to block this Goblin. That's right. Yeah, yeah you know, it would have been the, the smart thing to do. So he actually kept it in hand, like basically waited till it, it was the right turn and went off. I mean, how close this game was, was if if I had a third land, I think he had it, he would have had enough mana over the turns to actually throw all the spells out of his hand. Hmm. But... He stole on what land? One extra land and couldn't get enough cards out of his hand. All right, let's take a look at David Tomchek. He's playing Jund. Good old fashioned Jund sitting at nine and one. But oh boy, has he drawn a ringer this round? That is Seth Manfield, number one in the world right now in the top 25 pro rankings. <clears throat> and he's on Tron. Black Green Tron. Looks yeah, like. I mean, look, just because he won a standard. Um, Pro Tour doesn't mean that Seth Mansfield doesn't have game in modern. Um, Tron, really the choice of many, many, like, you know, top pros. We obviously saw earlier Steve Rubin playing it. Seth's played it. Uh, Corey Bar Barmeister is also playing a, a version of Tron. They think it's as well positioned. Tron is very, very good against some of the more mid-range decks. And we've seen quite a lot of them, like the Absands and Juns mm -hmm. out there. I mean, they almost just completely packed to, to, to Tron decks because they, they can't really disrupt the, the mana base and the big spells are just too big. And tr to be honest, Tron is actually one of the best decks against some of the Death Shadow decks too. You know, with a combination of like Expedition Map, Ancient Stirrings, all the cantrips with the chromatic star sphere, all those cards. It's <laughs> it's not that crazy to see turn three Tron. I mean, we see it all the time. We go, wow, that's so lucky. But they have so much consistency available to them. And they have Sylvan Scrying and other cards like that. So That is true. <coughs> it is not. I mean, the deck is clearly built to do so, right? I mean, the... Your, your jaw shouldn't drop when you when know burn player plays turn one goblin guide and then lightning bolts you right and you know you shouldn't be shocked if a tron deck says hey look i made the tron but <laughs> at the same time it just feels so stupid when they do <laughs> you're just like what is this i mean one of the great Karn things about on three come on <laughs> one of the great things about tron <coughs> is like obviously some of the best cards in modern are the black discard cards like thought seize inquisition of like Basically, the top decks from Tron are so good that it, it doesn't matter how much you rip apart their hand. Their best cards are land, and then all they have to do is like, top deck one of their like, heavy hitters after, even after your, your hand's been like, torn apart with discard spells. I mean, there's kind of like a, you know, a joke amongst uh, some players there. It's like you can't thought seize the top of your deck. Yeah. Well, and you know, the other thing is, is the... Um the interesting card, I think, that flies under the radar in that vein is Ancient Stirrings, yep. right? Where it's like, yeah, they might top deck a Karn or a big threat, which they have a lot of, but Stirrings is like five looks at one of those. Like, yep. they never miss, you know, that's yep. that's the kind of card that is so sick in the late game, yet also somehow sets up their Tron pieces? What? <laughs> it's insane. So, like, our main match is back underway. Why don't we jump back over there? Because it could be quick. 
And once again, a Goblin guy tapped and attacking here on turn one for Froelich. Yeah, no, so obviously, you know, Ifro with the optimal start. I don't, I don't know if he actually hit the land, but it looks like he did not hit the land uh, on that first turn. <coughs> after, after sideboarding, there's not a ton that gets better. I mean, Eric has access to Rest in Peace. I think he'll probably go there. Um, you think it's, it's so good that he would, even a card that doesn't enable his game plan, I mean, it does shut off a lot of the stuff from Storm, right? Yeah, I mean, Pass and Flames is the, obviously the biggest thing that gets hurt there, but, like, a lot of their great turn, like, turns involve Pass and Flames. Um, to hedge against that, actually, Storm usually moves towards, like, another strategy of, like, using Empty the Warrens. Um, so you don't actually need to go as high a, a Storm count you don't need, you know, a complete explosive turn to be able to actually still kill your opponent. I mean, the, the, the Storm deck, it actually has three Lightning Bolts um, in the sideboard, which almost definitely will come in because I think you want to have a little bit of interaction, especially against Monastery Swiss Spear and the Goblin Guide. Already down to 16. Yeah, the Goblin Guide, of course, doing its job. It's going to knock him down to 14 here. But Fro with not really much else going there, you know, you, you want to see him using up all that mana. I mean, he, he, yeah, he, he attempted to try and cast something with on, on two mana, was remanded by Brian. So buying him, you know, basically a full turn of burn. And, you know, that's all you need sometimes. Okay, so Brian actually may be trying to go off here because this is interesting because, I mean, Brian's still at 14. He has actually has a reasonable, you know, amount of time, yet he's actually... Are we doing it? I, I mean, it's possible, it's possible that he was... Yeah, he's got a... And empty the warrant, so he might be going for like a minor version. I see, because he knows those can be pretty good when you're at 14. Like it means yeah. he's not taking any damage on the ground. And looking at Eric's hand, it's going to be hard to piece together 14 damage. And you know, even the minor dam or minor version, as you put it, of this can sometimes just be like 10 goblins, oh, yeah. right? You know, no, that's I've that's like a pedestrian. No, for sure. So he can definitely he's cast three four, three spells. Um, he, he's going to be able to empty for eight goblins total. It's interesting. He, he, he pulled the trigger on this very aggressively, as in he, he knew his plan with the, the empty of the warrens, and, and he decided even though he's not in you know, specific danger of dying, he was happy to do like a minor storm turn of four spells Getting eight goblins. Two turn clock. Two turn clock. I mean, <laughs> and, you know, like, I, I wonder if he just, just realized that, you know, with the burn deck, sometimes just getting on the board is actually useful because one, it's going to turn off these goblin guides so he can actually, you know, whatever, octa block. <laughs> this is interesting, though. You see that Eric has a couple copies, I think, of Searing Blaze in hand? Yes. Oh, wow, he's got targets for those now. Now, there are targets in the deck, right? We, we saw Baral. There's also the Goblin Electromancer, too. But those are certainly turned on at this point, assuming that he's hitting land drops. And if he's not, then he's got six spells in his hand. And I think Eric's <laughs> probably a favorite from there. Yeah, I think Eric's actually a favorite now because, I yeah. mean, he actually had enough, like, upstairs burn Yeah, he available. did actually. You know, I was saying it's going to be hard to piece together 14 damage. But if you have all spells, it's actually quite, quite easy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's five spells, right? So Goblin Guide is basically put on defensive duty doesn't yeah. often get that point but it's goblin on goblin <laughs> crime here you, you never want to see this but but i mean the goblin the goblin guy does successfully prevent a two turn clock yes. it's it's actually very relevant here <laughs> to just 
block. But I think Eric's in great shape. I think he's going to win. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I agree too. I mean, Brian is probably able to... He's going to attack for eight, but only take seven. Actually, he's going to take six because he is going to get a one-point searing blaze onto one of the goblins. So bringing him to ten... Eric reminds Brian, I did kill that goblin. <laughs> and he's actually able to, he's got a lightning bolt and a grape shot. So he's actually able to go upstairs. Oh, he decided not to, but. Well, he this could be the death knell, couldn't it? Yeah, no, I, I'm actually thinking that. Um, well, you know, yeah, so he now is priced into using the lightning bolt on the guide. He has no blockers. <laughs> yeah. He, I mean, he, yeah. I, I oh, he does have a land drop to hit. Okay. Right. He, so he could grape shot away the guide and maybe throw a little bit upstairs? No? Yeah, uh, no, he's deciding to just lightning bolt the guide, I think. I guess he's just trying to set up for next turn, but likely there won't be, won't be one. Yeah, I mean, so he's going to attack with the <coughs> goblin here. Brian almost definitely going to lightning bolt. Brian's playing these turns much differently from like other Storm players I've seen. And it seems to be working well for him because he's very reticent to put a creature into play. Um, like, sorry, one of the cost reducers. Like, he's had that Goblin Electromancer since turn two or three, still has decided not to. And he could have played it last turn and, and Grape Shot for a little bit. Okay. I th so, I think that Ifro actually has... Oh, no. Would he not have just killed him? Yeah, we just killed him. So, But he's not dead here either, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or he, six, and then stuff? Yeah, I mean, Brian does have a grape shot in hand. He does have a bunch of spells, so he may be trying to bait Brian into going off a little bit. What if Fro has a uh, lightning helix? That could change the math. A, yeah, it would definitely change the math. Because he is going for another mini storm with the attempt being a grape shot to kill you. And he has... And the there helix. it is. Lightning Helix from Eric Froelich. Puts it on the stack. And the way that he put it down makes me think that it was enough. Now, I do see another grape shot in hand for Brian. Does he have mana floating? He does. Another yep. grape shot. And Brian wins the match two games to zero over Eric Froelich, handing him his second loss and putting Eric... You know, he's on life support now, right? Yeah. He does not have another loss to give. So he won his first match today, lost his second, but the Storm player just running right through the tables. And now we're back on Jun versus Black Rain Tron. Perhaps a more interactive matchup, though. We see stone nothing <laughs> on the battlefield for either player. And I see why. Look at the graveyard of Seth Manfield. Oh, Oblivion Stone. Yeah, and did, you, did you see what I did there? I, you set know. me up? No, I said stone nothing. Anyway. Oh, I get it. Oh. Yeah. Well, come on, give me some yeah. love here. Can yeah, you, you yeah. Know. Shower me with praise. It's a little, it's a little <laughs> early in the morning for this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you don't even have a coffee next <laughs> it's to you. Yet. It's like, come on. All right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll warm up. Is the <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to overwhelm you here. Oh, there's the Karn Father himself, Karn Liberated, and that's going to be, that's going to be the GGs. Yeah, th th this is a nightmare matchup for for Jund. Oh yeah. It, I mean. You have to actually contort your deck quite significantly with either Jund or Absan to to give yourself a chance against the Tron decks. I mean, you know, usually involving something like either Blood Moon or like Fulminator Mage com combined with Surgical Extraction or something weird like that to even give you a sniff of a chance. And half the time that doesn't work because, you know, Tron decks just Tron early and play a huge threat. Yeah, and that's going to do it. David just extends the hand to the PT champ, Seth Manfield, and says, I'm not beating a car in this game, my friend. Good yeah. game. And uh, that is going to do it for that round. Woo! Those, I mean, those games were actually <laughs> really, really good. I mean, if, if you didn't catch that, like, Ifro at the end played an Inspiring Vantage, tapped, because that was his fourth land. If, it, if he had a land that counted to play untapped, he would have won the game yeah, immediately on the How crazy is that? Was, that's how close it was. All right, close, close games here in our live matches. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, though, we'll have Time Walk Magic or something similar here from Oklahoma City. We'll see you in just a bit.